Abortion has been the law of the land since Roe versus Wade for nearly 50 years. So for a lot of us in the pro-life movement, Roe has overshadowed our entire lives. And we've gone about our pro-life work with Roe as this constant presence looming over us. Now, after Roe's reversal on June 24th, it's a new dawn. It's the first time many of us are working to change minds, to save lives, to serve women and families in a post Roe era. Today's guest is an expert in the art of changing minds, primarily on matters of faith and also the issue of abortion. Trent Horn is a Catholic convert like myself, and he shares his skills in defending the faith on radio and public debates as a professor at Holy Apostles College through books and through his own podcast at Council Trent. So join me today on Explicitly Pro-Life as we have a conversation with Trent Horn about changing minds in a post-Roe world. Abortions may be regulated, but not prohibited by state law. There is no constitutional right to an abortion in this country anymore as of today. I knew we had to have you come back on now that we're in this post row era because I wanted to hear from you what you are hearing and how your work as a pro-life apologist has changed since the fall of Roe versus Wade. Uh, well, a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way that you, you have, well, you have honestly, during the rover, during the period when Roe was active, I think one of the biggest struggles we had was getting people to talk about abortion at all. It was just a subject that nobody wanted to talk about. And the other side, the pro-choice side knew that as long as nobody talked about it, they won. Because under Roe, abortion was legal in a state. Basically, it was legal if there was an abortionist willing to perform an abortion. So the, I think the only thing that kept a state from having late term abortion was that there just weren't enough. I mean, it's grisly enough to be an abortion provider. Only the, the most hardened of hearts do like the late term abortion things. So you only have certain states where they'll even set up shop to do that. Uh, so they realize, look, we just don't, if nobody talks about it, then we win because it's legal and everything's fine. But now that Roe has been overturned and states have been able to restrict abortion in meaningful ways that they were unable to do for 50 years, 15 weeks, but not just 15 weeks, six weeks, uh, essential ban on abortions, the things we see here in Georgia and Texas and Florida, that now the other side has come to grips with the, the has come to grips with the fact that they have to talk about abortion. And what's interesting is I see more people being willing to embrace the word abortion, even usually they would cloak that with reproductive rights. They, they were afraid to say the word, but now they're they're all in on it, though. They try to conjure up the image behind the word abortion of just being a woman who seeks his procedure for whatever she, reasons she sees fit. Uh, so there's a lot uh, more people are talking about it. Uh, I've created a booklet, Why We're Pro-Life, a mass-produced one to help people to give away to friends and family members. It's written in language a pro-choice person can appreciate. It's written for them, really. Uh, but now people are talking about the issue. And I think we have to prepare others. Uh, I, I do think that the, the one tactic that I think is being brought up a lot would be the hard cases, frankly. Uh, I, I think that abortions that are obtained for these uh, in these difficult circumstances, issues related to rape or the life and health of a mother, they're being used as a wedge 
and I, I want to get your thoughts too, and have a back and forth on this because going after the midterms, it, it was disappointing to see the ballot measures fail when it came to abortion. But pro-lifers were able to succeed at the state with state legislatures passing laws and the politicians who passed them rema- retaining their seats. So that's another thing to look into why that is the case. But in seeing this, I think that many people, when they vote on the issue, they basically think to themselves, I don't like abortion, but if I need to keep it legal the whole way through to cover the hard cases, I'm willing to, to stomach that, to, to deal with these hard cases. So I think that that is the wedge the other side is really driving with on this issue. How do you think pro-lifers should respond to that? Because... Some of the conversations I've had, especially in the lead up to the midterm election, was that, you know, pro-lifers really just need to cave on this issue. We need to counsel our political leaders who are running for office to say that they support, you know, violent exceptions for children uh, who were conceived during sexual assault. Um, Because if we would just say that, things would be so much better for us. My personal experience has been when I've had conversations with folks on campuses, um, that doesn't make them instantly become pro-life or over on my side. In fact, when I you know get rid of that fear, or if I say, well, let's set that aside for a second and let's just pretend that you and I agree with that. Do you agree with me that 97% of all other abortions are wrong? And would you fight, join with me to fight against them? I've never found a student that would say yes to that question. Right, and I think though, there's a difference between the students you'll meet on a college campus and just regular people who are at their dinner table, uh, you know, and that's, that is a good thing. Uh, I have two thoughts on this. Uh, one would be, well, essentially there's a difference between, uh, how we explain the pro-life message to an individual and walk them through why the pro-life worldview is true versus uh, particular political goals that the pro-life movement might be aiming for. Because ultimately, the goal of the pro-life movement is to secure the right to life for every single human being. And so the pro-life position, the moral position, must not compromise on that. Otherwise, it will be arbitrary and self-defeating. The moral position has to be consistent, true. It has to just accord with reality that every human being has a right to life. Now, saying that, there is room for debate among pro-lifers about what kind of laws uh, we will choose to pass. Uh, For example, Pope St. John Paul II in the Gospel of Life, uh, Evangelium Vitae, in, I believe it was paragraph 70, section 73, he said that a pro-life legislator, as long as his personal opposition to abortion was well known, could advocate for a law that restricts abortion, even if it does not entirely restrict it if that is the most feasible law he can pass. So I do think that there is room to say that it is licit to pass a to pass a law that does not secure the entire pro-life position. I mean, Florida's law stops at 15 weeks. Uh, Georgia stops at six weeks, for example. So these are not the ideals. But in politics, one, mo- one must not make the perfect the enemy of the good. So I do think we shouldn't compromise the moral position at all. But And this is every other successful social movement has done this, by the way. I mean, think about it. The, the LGBTQ civil rights movement did not start with uh, drag queen story hour, right? They didn't start there, that's for sure. They were able to end there. But they got there through a bunch of incremental uh, propositions that sound, people say, yeah, I don't like all this crazy LGBT stuff, but, but you know, not discriminating and, and two people getting married. OK. And then eventually people you know, are more open to the ideas down the line. I think every successful social movement will move incrementally. And so um, that's one thought there. And I, we could, I'd love to get your thoughts on the, more of a back and forth. Uh, the, the means we do it, too, also might identify this. I don't think we should be that discouraged about ballot measures not succeeding. The ballot measures, especially in states, was more disappointing in like Kentucky, where you're trying to just say there's no right to abortion. That was really a referendum on their previous ban that the the legislature had passed. Um, That was still a very close ballot measure. We have to remember, like Gallup, when they poll people on abortion, 25 percent are very pro-life, 25 percent are very pro-choice, 50 percent are mushy middle. They, they want abortion in hard cases, 
They definitely want hard cases, but they're ambivalent towards the others. So there's never been a point where pro life, where we had a majority of people saying, yes, we want all abortions to be illegal. Just like there's never been a majority saying they want them all legal either. So there are just some issues that don't succeed as well at the ballot when they require a referendum versus when the legislature uh, passes them. And there's not a lot of, of pushback from that. I think folks need to keep in mind that uh, the voters are and the, the way an election turns out is vastly different than polling the state. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about after the referendum was I should just commission a bunch of polls in Michigan and Montana and Kentucky proving that voters in those states, those states actually agree with the pro-life position. And I could do that. Um, but that, but but they didn't vote that way. And there's a lot of factors. Turnout is a factor. Messaging of those campaigns or the lack of messaging on those campaigns. I mean, I'm, I don't want to criticize anyone or any organization, so I'm not going to get into that. But there's a lot that goes into that. I, I have to be frank with you. I'm going to say this. If I get in trouble, whatever, you can blame me. Yeah, you can't. That's right. I will be explicit. Um, it's not just about having the truth. It's also about having successful messaging. Uh, so if you lack that, and, and the pro-abort side will twist and they'll lie, they'll twist what you say. So that's going to happen. You can't evade that. All you can do is steal your position enough to keep it from getting out of hand. Uh, so uh, an example, like, so with that messaging, like for example, in Montana, what the pro-choice side did, you think, how could a Born Alive Infant Protection Act fail in Montana, of all places? Well, they crafted a narrative saying that if you pass this law, if a mother gives birth to a baby who's definitely going to die, they're going to take the baby away, and the mother can't even hold their child as they die, and they're going to perform futile care on this child that won't do any good. Any sane person, like in bioethics, we know that's disproportionate care. There's nothing wrong with allowing someone to die naturally. The point of the law was to prevent children who survive abortion from being killed through passive euthanasia. But the law was not worded concisely enough to avoid this objection, and, and it was exploited by the other side. Uh, the other, so you, if you're passing the laws, they got to be bulletproof in there and clear in what is being said here. Uh, and I think incremental is 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 also a way to go. And I, th I think the 15 week bans and even the six week bans have a lot going for them in this regard. The other one that I'll be critical of is um, I was looking at uh, Michigan, for example. Now, Michigan is going to be a hard one. There's a lot of pro-choice uh, supporters there. But I compared the two signs. I, I looked up because I was making a video. I wanted to get a picture of the signs. So the pro abortion side, which was vote yes on the referendum for there is a right to abortion. Yeah, when you have a yes, people want to vote yes on things naturally, and it has it's purple and it has it's this good design. It's got pictures of women on it. Restore row for women, even though it's not really doing that, but it makes it look like we want you to help women. If you look at this sign, it's like okay, and then you look at the pro life signs. I don't know if there are any others, but the ones that I found online were black and white and red. Vote no, vote no on Prop 3, confusing extreme. That sign is confusing. I don't know what the hell you're, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So there, right there, even if you have the good intentions and the truth, your messaging has gone to heck. That in doing that, you're, you know, I, when I look at that, I don't, what is confusing? What is extreme? I, I don't get, it's to quote Tom Hanks from the movie Big. I don't get it. If only they had had him in the meeting when they're talking about this. They, I don't get it. And I, and I don't. It should be something like uh, keep uh, protect this child's life and show a fourth or fifth trimester unborn child. A, a, a show a baby. Show a baby. And, and it's fair game to do second and third trimester because the other side is saying they want right to abortion up till birth. And, and so that's the other thing that if the, uh, the pro-abortion side can exploit hard cases for pro-lifers, pro-lifers are, f it's totally fair to exploit the hard cases for pro-abortion advocates. We should be, it's always hard. We, we always think we want to play nice and we should never lie. We should never be, you know, we should never lie. We should never do evil. 
but don't treat people don't treat these people with kid gloves. Point out that say, look, your position is abortion should be legal up until and possibly through birth. And then ask, where are you going to draw the line? Tell me, will you support a ban on elective abortions after 30 weeks, 15 weeks? And they'll they'll say no. They can't say yes to anything. So we so I think that we going forward, we have to also be aggressive to call out uh, the hard cases that the other side squirms about sex, selective abortion, uh, uh, multiple abortions, uh, abortions done purely for to obtain fetuses for research, fetal body part sales. That's the other thing I think we need to focus on. I even plan for this podcast to go this direction, Trent, but this is so important. And I'm so glad to hear you saying the thoughts that are in my head that I wasn't going to say, but thank you for saying them because I've been, you know, since the election, you would not believe the number of angry text messages and emails I've gotten, you know, you pro-lifers screwed this up and you should know better. And it, you know, it's, it's very difficult because you, many of us, whether it was referendums or the midterms and it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we the pro-life movement, first of all, we're not a monolithic group. I wasn't consulted about the yard signs in Michigan. I wasn't even welcome to, to work in Michigan on this referendum. Um, but the pro-life movement was outspent 35 to one. And there were more than $400 million in TV ads that have so far been tracked about abortion from the democratic side. Uh, this this election cycle uh, it is unbelievable. I mean, it's almost like you know in war where you think about like there are some times in war where you are outmanned, you're outgunned, and you're you're not going to get done what you need to get done. And so what you need to do is you need to get inside of your fortress as fast as possible. You need to barricade it, and you need to make sure your army survives what's happening. Um, And we did like it actually is a victory, not even talking about the state legislative victories and how all of these governors who signed important pro-life legislation that saves significant amount of lives, how they all got elected or the fact that, you know, Senator Marco Rubio was in a tough contest and he got on TV and, you know, defended the, his entire 100% pro-life position brilliantly and they still couldn't take him down. There's a lot of victories, but the simple fact that we emerged on Wednesday, we came out of the fortress and yeah, there were like losses and there were, you know, holes in the walls but we withstood $400 million, that in itself is a victory. And even that in Michigan, it was 55-45. It was not a blowout. We knew there'd be blowouts in California and Vermont. Like those are pro-abortion states. Uh, no, even knowing Roe versus Wade was overturned, we've always known, you know, we're, we're not going to get probably a pro-life California right until the moment before hell freezes over, you know, until the second coming. It's very hard, but there's other places where, where it can be done. So in Michigan, even despite uh, being outspent, it was 55-45, even despite having poor messaging, frankly, um, it goes well. And you're right that when you look at it, you can't say, oh, you lost this ballot proposition, so the pro-life movement is over. By that logic, the so-called same-sex marriage movement should be over. They lost, uh, you know, they lost ballot measures. They went to ballot measures to try to approve same-sex marriage, and they continually lost. But what did they do? They just kept at it, knowing that even campaigning for it raised the issue in the public consciousness. So I I think that that is um, important moving forward to keep that in mind, that uh, even if you lose, you still win uh, as long as as long as it was done in good faith and and you haven't really badly blundered or squandered resources. uh, It's any you know, it's worth it's worth fighting for. And you learn lessons from it and, and you move forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is so important if you look at the history of the same-sex marriage movement and what they did. Um, What's been frustrating to me, I'll have to be honest with you, I don't know the conversations you're having down there in Texas about this, but, um, you know, I've been, you know, sounding the alarm and we already know that the model that was used in Michigan, they're going to try to adopt and take to several states, Ohio, Missouri, Georgia. I mean, they, they already know they're going to just take the model and export it. And so the question is, how do we as pro-lifers fight that model while knowing we're probably going to be outspent? We're not going to have the Hollywood money flowing in. And the 
political mentors that I've talked to in the past two, few weeks, um, it's actually pretty sad. Folks are like, Kristen, unless you're committing to raising a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred million dollars and outspending them, there's nothing you can do. You're going to lose. And I'm like, I reject that sentiment completely. There has to be a campaign in the box format template that we can create that we can go into states regardless of what their state right to life or pro-life structure is and we can implement to get national pro-life organizations involved um, and to get people working together uh, using science and data and good messaging research to combat this uh, i don't know that's what kristen will be doing for the next several months is trying to figure out how to do that um, we'll see if i'm successful but uh it's, it's, it's going to be a massive undertaking. No, and we have time. I mean, it's another two years. Because I think the successful route that the pro-abortion movement will try to take on this are the ballot proposals. Um, trying to put it on a ballot. Uh, though I think they did benefit this time around with high turnout because it is an opposition midterm. So, I mean, you, you have to take into account that midterms, gen, you know, are generally not high turnout. And and I think also for pro-lifers, this is going to be a test that the side that thinks it's winning doesn't try as hard. That was the case for pro-choice for 50 years. Now we have a taste of that and we have to resist that temptation. So I, I am optimistic uh, in that regard that we can at least defeat these kinds of measures. But yeah, pro-life groups are going to have to, and others who are allied with them, will have to invest in the messaging of just how do we yeah, what is most feasible? Do we just try to defeat these uh, movements or do we try to go for a full court press of saying things like there is no right to abortion, uh, things like that? Sometimes sometimes you have an easier aim just trying to uh, defeat a message, for example, and just uh, pointing out where it's extreme and other elements like that. But there there is time. But, but we have to remember, this is it's so funny. People say to me, like, what about the backlash and oh, this and that? Uh, no. The fact of the matter is, there's having Dobbs was an amazing victory, and and even if we do have states that that put forward uh, amendments to add to their constitution, the great great thing is con they can always be amended again. You know, uh, we we can never get as worse. The only thing we could get worse than what Roe was might be some some kind of federal uh, thing, but even there, I, I don't see it going there out or even being worse, frankly. Uh, 10 after Dobbs, uh, 10, at least 10,000 lives have been saved since then. If you do, if you add up all the numbers, it was completely worth it. Now it's like, look, you poked the, you poked the bear. You have to be ready to fight the bear. You didn't, you did, did you think nothing was going to happen? There's a national diaper shortage. This is how extreme pro-abortion people are. Instead of like, I don't know, making more diapers, the complainer, the article was was a complainer saying that it's our fault, our pro-life pregnancy centers and pro-lifers, that there's a diaper shortage. <laughs> so we should just kill babies because that's the obvious solution to a diaper shortage in America. I think there's a lot of folks in the pro-life movement who aren't really ready or willing to acknowledge that uh, we engage in this battle to make abortion unthinkable and unavailable. Uh, part of that engagement means we have to be averse and understand how politics works. We've actually started offering Soon Swipe Action uh, a pro-life political workshop. And it's just like a one day, how politics works. You'll come away completely depressed kind of from a lot of this stuff to say like, this is what politicians want. This is what they're seeking. This is how we can, once we understand what we're, we're who we're dealing with, how we can achieve our political agenda. And we have to be so smart uh, about that and be strategic about the, the aims we seek. And I think it's, I also think going back to your earlier point of talking about you know, we as Catholics, as pro-lifers, we can, you know, if, if I were elected to office, I could vote for legislation that allows abortions in some cases while restricting other types of abortions because I would be a vocal anti-abortion advocate. I think there's a, a difference too of like, we as the pro-life movement should always be setting the standard and the goal and saying, this is what we desire. This is what we're working towards. We can certainly support politicians who say, you know, 
I'm with you, but I'm going to pledge to, you know, to only ban 97% of abortions. Okay. Yeah. We can work with you, Mr. Politician. I just think it's, I think we need to be careful as a movement of like saying we're going to change our goal to meet what the political standard is. And I don't think we should ever do that. And looking at the political movements in the, the civil rights movement and these others, huge movements in the past, we need to be very careful uh, but how we do that? Think about the Emancipation Proclamation. It didn't end slavery in the United States. It, it was only it was only a partway goal. So I think that that's what we have to understand is the moral position we cannot compromise on, but the political position we must compromise. That's what politics is. It's the art of compromise. And people might have these fantasies of having a of reaching a political goal through sheer will to power. That's just not how it plays out in the real world. And we can use the politics. We can use the laws to change minds. So I don't know. I'm known, someone call me as the person who's never satisfied. That's the goal. Like political leaders should see us and go, oh, those are those annoying people again. Those pro-lifers, they're never satisfied. Yep, that's exactly right. You betcha I'm never satisfied until all abortions end. And when I say compromise, though, yeah, when I say compromise, I don't mean just completely giving up or being wishy-washy. What I mean is uh, make, you know, making a prudent decision to achieve a goal now that is not your ideal goal, but the point in choosing it now is so that you have a clearer path to reach the ideal goal in the future. Uh, that th There's just a difference between a dream and a vision. A dream is something you don't think about how to get there. A vision is you have a concrete plan. Pro-lifers need to have visions, not dreams. All right. We have a few more minutes to go before I have to wrap up. What are your, I've certainly got, I've been on campuses a lot since Roe was reversed. Our team has been on campus a lot. We've heard a lot of arguments, as you said, kind of these, the hard cases, rape, life of the mother. Um, what are some new ways you're having discussions that you have found to be effective now in this post-Roe era to get, you know, to leave that seed of hope, to plant that seed of hope, to change minds, you know, now or in the future. I found that the arguments and case that I have been making personally for the last 20 years uh, are still the most successful. When you focus the issue on only one question, uh, when you help people to see the justifications for abortion, don't justify killing a two-year-old, when you demand that they define what a person is, uh, when you ask, well, you're, okay, you're saying the child's a baby, it's a human being, but it doesn't have a right to another person's body. Well, as a human being, what rights does he or she have? Uh, I think the biggest challenge we're facing now, is some people have said, I've read online, you know, pro-lifers fail to change people's hearts and minds. Even if we remain stagnant over the last 20 years, I consider that a victory because frankly, I think one of the biggest things we're dealing with now is the world has gotten worse. People are are more callous, they're more cruel, they're more desensitized, that the, the deaths of children don't phase them because this is a generation that has indulged not just in sexual pornography, but in the pornography of the internet where you can look up dead bodies, watch disasters, see horrible things happen all the time, and you're constantly inundated with garbage, constantly inundated with screens and information you're just so desensitized and you you create this cynical, uh, macabre humor and, and idea of just not caring and being weirdly ironic to adjust to the world. Uh, so I do think we, the hard thing we're going to face going forward is people having these much harder hearts than they had maybe 10 or 20 years ago and uh, trying to help people to look beyond just their How own How do we soften those hard hearts? Because I certainly see that... Uh, in the past year. I think we have to pray, pray really hard for the Holy Spirit to open people's hearts. Uh, I think that we have to show radical kindness so that people are dismayed, that we do not have to embrace the same cynicism, that we can be firm, uh, but also assertive in our reply and show that we have a joy in having the truth and that we're, able to we're fulfilled, and especially in the pro-life world that we have marriage, we have family, uh, the thing that's really driving people to support abortion, frankly, is we have the lowest rate of people getting married ever. Uh, unmarried people support legal abortion far more than married people. Uh, so I think uh, promoting those kinds of institutions also has an important role. Absolutely. So I'm exit polling single unmarried women. It was like in the 70 percent voted for Democrats. It was 
unbelievable. I mean, what a stunning indictment on the Democrats' support base, by the way. But it, it, it there's there's a lot I can say. But yeah, I think that's 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 one of the things that it's been very hard on campuses. We've seen certainly in the past. Mm, two years since COVID of this conversation of, well, my life doesn't matter. My life doesn't matter at all. So uh, it, it, when you're starting a conversation with somebody who doesn't think their life matters, it's going to be really hard to convince them that a human being and a woman's stomach actually matters too. And so, you know, I, I think I've been ending, I think all of my speeches on campuses recently of, of, of a line of something of the fact that if you haven't been told lady, lately, your life matters and you matter. Um, I think that is a, that's somewhere we're definitely gonna have to start. So try, thanks so much for getting on. I can't wait to, I actually, when you were talking, I went to Catholic Answers and I bought the Why We're Pro-Life booklet. I wish it was digital, um, but I will get the, I will get the hard copy. Um, for myself, because I think this is going to be a great resource for uh, for our team at Students for Life. Where can folks follow and learn more about what you're doing and read your writings? Sure. Well, they can check me out at Catholic Answers at Catholic.com. I have a podcast, The Council of Trent, uh, and they can check that on iTunes, uh, YouTube. Uh, also, they can support at TrentHornPodcast.com. Thanks, Trent, for coming on. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life podcast. I hope this today's conversation about the 2022 midterm elections, about the conversations we're having now in the post war era were helpful uh, and give you some starting ground and some tips for how to keep those conversations going so we can continue to change hearts and minds and save lives and move forward together in our goal to abolish abortion, making it unthinkable and unavailable throughout our land and most importantly, in our lifetime to get this job done. Bye everyone.